Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. In this session, we are going to talk about the Sagar Doctrine of India. It happens to be an important topic under international relations. And in this session, we are going to understand about India's focus in the Indian Ocean region and talk about the Sagar Doctrine, which today is an integral policy, which is a part of Indian foreign policy. But before that, if you're liking the knowledge series initiative, do let us know by pressing the like button, share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start by talking about the Sagar Doctrine of India. In Sagar Doctrine, the term Sagar, which means the sea or the ocean, it's actually an acronym. It's an acronym which can be expanded and it stands for security and growth for all in the region. This is India's exclusive foreign policy doctrine that's focused on the Indian Ocean region. It provides for India's outreach into the Indian Ocean and it lays down India's vision and the geopolitical framework for maritime cooperation all across the Indian Ocean region. This foreign policy doctrine was launched by Prime Minister Modi in the year 2015 when he was visiting two important Indian Ocean countries that is Mauritius and Sessions. In 2015, he paid an important visit to these island countries and he was inaugurating the coastal surveillance radars that were built by India. During this visit, several key agreements were also signed with these Indian Ocean island nations. And during this event, the Prime Minister announced the launch of India's Sagar Doctrine, that is security and growth for all in the region. Through this doctrine, India envisions itself as the primary leader of the Indian Ocean and it guarantees security and growth for all the countries that are spread across the Indian Ocean. Now this is where you need to understand the importance of the Indian Ocean. What is the strategic and economic significance of the Indian Ocean, especially from India's point of view? See, traditionally, the Indian Ocean has been the strategic backyard of India. Many experts say that the Indian Ocean happens to be the strategic backyard of India. Meaning, India has been the predominant power and influence in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean has largely been dominated by India. This is true in modern times and as well as in the ancient medieval times as well. If you go back in time, if you go back a few centuries, if you observe India's equations with the other parts of the Indian Ocean, you will notice that India had an active trading relationship with many other regions of the Indian Ocean. For example, traders from the west coast of India, from Gujarat to the Malabar coast, they had an active trading relationship with the Gulf, that's the West Asia region, and even with East Africa. Even Arab merchants, they would often come to the west coast of India. So there was not, not just economic relations, but there was also a cultural relationship through which cultural ideologies were also being exchanged. Then if you look at the Cholas, the Pallavas, they also had an active influence across today's Southeast Asia, particularly towards Ind uh, Indonesia and Singapore. The Cholas and Pallavas were very influential all across this region. They had a trading relationship, they had a political, strategic relationship as well in the Southeast Asia region. So since many centuries, India has been the center of the Indian Ocean region. India has been the fulcrum of the Indian Ocean region. During the ancient medieval times, the trade that was taking place here, it would rely on the monsoon trade winds. The sail ships, which we used to bring and exchange goods between these regions, they used to rely on the monsoon trade winds and they would connect with the vast Indian civilization. So this is true in the modern context as well, post-independence. For India, the Indian Ocean has been critical, both from a security point of view and even with regard to its economic status. Because India shares a long coastline of more than 7,500 kilometers. We also have two major island territories, that is the Lakshadweep Islands over here and the Andaman Nicobar Islands. So India has been a predominant naval maritime power and the Indian Ocean defines India's fortunes. It plays a critical role in our national security and as well as in ensuring our economic security. 
Even today, we have very close trade and cultural relations with all these littoral states, that is the coastal states, the rim states of the Indian Ocean. So that is why it is important for India to give exclusive focus and attention to this part of the world. Today, the Indo-Pacific has emerged as the global hub with regard to geopolitics and economic growth. There is intense competition across the Indo-Pacific between the major powers such as US and China. These external powers are building a significant military and strategic presence in the Indian Ocean. For example, in this map, you can see the Diego Garcia Island over here, which is actually a British overseas territory. It's a British Indian Ocean territory. Britain has held this during since the colonial times. Post the World War, Britain leased the Diego Garcia Island to US. And since then, the US has built a major naval base at Diego Garcia. China of late has been stepping up its military naval presence all across the Indian Ocean. It has built strategic ports in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, in Pakistan, as well as in Africa, and has gained access to West Asia and Southeast Asia. Recently, China even set up its first foreign military base in this small East African country over here, known as Djibouti. And also note that the Indian Ocean is bound by several choke points. There are several narrow waterways which are crucial for the global economy and as well as for the Indian economy. But these are choke points which can be easily blocked and that could have a huge impact on the economy of the region. We have choke points such as the Strait of Hormuz over here between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. This is where most of India's oil imports come from. Our energy security is heavily dependent on the Strait of Hormuz. Then you have the Babel Mandeb Strait over here connecting the Red Sea with the Gulf of Aden. Again, a narrow choke point, but critical for the global economy, especially for India, to connect with Europe and the Atlantic. Then you have the Mozambique Channel over here in East Africa, sandwiched between Mozambique and Madagascar. Again, an important shipping lane. And you have the Strait of Malacca, sandwiched between Indonesia and Singapore, which is crucial for the global economy and as well as for India. Nearly 55% of India's trade passes through the Strait of Malacca. So this whole region is strategically and economically very crucial, very important for us. That's the reason why India has always paid a lot of attention to this region and we want to give utmost attention and focus in the coming years as well. We also envision a number of threats over here. There are a number of traditional and hybrid security threats that we face. For example, here in the Horn of Africa region, that is towards the Gulf of Aden, piracy is very active. Somalian pirates, they threaten shipping over here. This directly affects India's economic and security interests. There are many terror outfits as well operating in the region. For example, the Al-Shabaab that has a presence in Somalia. This group is affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Organized crime is also very prevalent in the Indian Ocean. There are many organized criminal groups involved in drug trafficking, arms smuggling, etc. And off late, radicalism and extremism has been increasing in some of the Indian Ocean countries, particularly in Maldives and Sri Lanka. So all these developments, they pose a threat to our national security and it also plays a determining role in our economic fortunes. So that is why to pay attention to this important region, India has brought out a dedicated foreign policy doctrine called the Sagar Doctrine. That is security and growth for all in the region. Through this, India wants to retain its predominant position and ensure that the Indian Ocean remains its strategic backyard. India should be the dominant power and influence over here. And for this, we need to retain our influence and also to build upon it. We have to revive our ties with all the Indian Ocean countries. We have to work closely with important groupings that are focused on the Indian Ocean. We will have to focus on maritime security and as well as on promoting economic and cultural relations with all these countries. At the same time, India will also have to take steps to counter various threats, including terrorism, piracy, and also the threats posed by disasters. Because Indian Ocean is very vulnerable to natural disasters. Cyclones, tsunamis, rising sea level, they all threaten livelihoods across the Indian Ocean and India can actually help a number of countries. But our primary focus 
is to counter the rising Chinese influence across the Indian Ocean. In the last few years, particularly in the last 15 years, China's naval presence has gone up significantly across the Indian Ocean and this directly threatens India's maritime interests. So it's with this objective in mind that India brought out the Sagar Doctrine. Prime Minister Modi announced the Sagar Doctrine in 2015 to provide renewed attention to this important region so that India can emerge as the net security provider of the region. This is India's vision. This is India's ambition. It wants to emerge as the net security provider and guarantee not just maritime security to other countries, but also guarantee economic security and growth to all the Indian Ocean countries, especially to the small island nations. This is the focus of our Sagar Doctrine. The idea is to ensure that India becomes the net security provider. All the other countries here, like Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, the East African countries, Sri Lanka, they should perceive India as the net security provider. If they face any challenges, if they face any threats, the first country they should seek out help from should be India. And for that to happen, India should have the ab abilities to provide for maritime security and economic growth all across the Indian Ocean. So to realize this vision, the Sagar Doctrine has been launched and you can already see the Sagar Doctrine in operation in almost every country of the Indian Ocean. So I'm just going to take you through some of the Indian initiatives focused on Indian Ocean countries that will help you understand how we are implementing and realizing the vision of the Sagar Doctrine. For example, if you take a look at Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka there is active competition between India and China with regard to infrastructure and strategic projects. China has already made very big investments over here. It has taken up the construction of the strategic Hambantota port and Matala airport in southern Sri Lanka. It has built the Colombo port over here, which is a very important international hub for shipping. China has recently won the contract to develop the East Container Terminal as well at the Colombo port. Apart from that, China is heavily invested in many other infrastructure projects in the country. Today, of course, Sri Lanka is facing a grave economic crisis. I'm sure all of you would have read about what is happening in Sri Lanka in the last few months, especially in the last few days. So despite the grave economic crisis that Sri Lanka is staring at, it is still a very important country because it lies at the very heart of the Indian Ocean. Sri Lanka is a preferred shipping hub. It connects the West with the East. It has state-of-the-art port facilities. And for this, for this reason, it is very, very crucial for India. Plus, we have important interests to protect over here. So India has also taken up many important projects to counter the Chinese influence. We have taken up many infrastructure and reconstruction projects in northern and eastern Sri Lanka, which was largely damaged and destroyed through the civil war, the civil war between the Tamil minorities and the Sinhala Buddhist majority. India has revived the Kake Senturai railway line and port. We have rebuilt the Palale Air Base and also built houses in northern Sri Lanka to accommodate the Tamil refugees. Apart from this, we have recently won the contract to develop the West Container Terminal at the Colombo port and also to develop oil tank farms at the Trinko Malay port, which is an important port located in eastern Sri Lanka. India has also won the contract to develop a power plant, a thermal power plant at Sampur near Trinko Malay. We are also getting involved in renewable energy projects in the Jaffna Peninsula. So essentially, India has stepped up its economic investments and strategic presence and we even conduct many important military exercises with this country. For example, we have exercises like Mitra Shakti, which is a bilateral exercise between the Indian Army and the Sri Lankan Army. Then we have naval exercise as well called Slinex. So th through these security exercises or military exercises, we are stepping up our security cooperation as well and also offering economic advantages to Sri Lanka. As the country is staring at a grave crisis, India has provided around $3.5 billion in economic aid to help the country overcome this crisis. So in many ways, India is guaranteeing the security of the country. We are guaranteeing the maritime security of the nation, that is the maritime security of Sri Lanka, 
and we are also guaranteeing economic security to Sri Lanka. This is how India aims to retain its influence and build upon it and to counter the Chinese influence. This is at the very heart of the Sagar doctrine of India. You will see this approach not just in Sri Lanka, but you can find the same approach all across the Indian Ocean. If you look at the other island nations here, especially Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles, these are priority countries for India, the focus countries. Because traditionally, India has been very influential in these small island nations. Even though these are very small countries, they hold a great deal of strategic significance. Mauritius, Maldives and Seychelles. They have always been close to India, historically. In Mauritius especially, you have a strong Indian community. Maldives has always shared very close economic and cultural ties with India. The same goes for Seychelles. So India has given utmost focus and attention to these countries. And off late, India has helped in the defense and security of these countries. India not only supplies weapons, but we also provide training to the armed forces of these countries. In fact, many of their soldiers, their officers, their bureaucrats, diplomats, they're all trained in Indian institutions, Indian academies. So we're helping this, th these countries in capacity building. We're also supplying military hardware, including reconnaissance aircrafts to carry out maritime surveillance and reconnaissance. We have even supplied naval ships and naval boats and even provided helicopters such as the ALH Drove to help these small countries to secure their exclusive economic zones. All these small island nations, they have a significant EEZ in the Indian Ocean. So their economic resources, their integrity is threatened by piracy and terrorism, by the non-state actors who operate in the Indian Ocean. So to guarantee their maritime security, the Indian Navy is constantly deployed near these countries. There are constant missions of the Indian Navy all across these countries. We basically guarantee their maritime security and we try to provide maritime surveillance and reconnaissance across their exclusive economic zones. So we have supplied weapons, military hardware including aircrafts, helicopters and naval boats to strengthen their maritime security. Whenever they face an economic crisis, India is there to provide economic assistance. In fact, even during the recent pandemic, when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, India launched two missions. Mission Sagar 1, that was phase 1 of Mission Sagar, and Mission Sagar 2, the second phase of it. Under these missions, India supplied essential medical items. India supplied oxygen tanks, sanitizers, PPE kits, masks, etc. So all these countries here, even in East Africa, countries like Mozambique, countries like Tanzania, Kenya, they have all been close to India and they have all been supported by India during the pandemic. So all these major countries here, including Comoros, Madagascar, Mauritius, they have all been backed by India during the pandemic through Mission Sagar. Later, we even supplied the vaccines. We even engaged in vaccine diplomacy and supplied vaccines that were produced in India free of cost to many of these small countries. So in, in a way, India ensured that these countries can overcome and fight the pandemic and secure their, their economic interests. So that is how India is playing a crucial role all across the Indian Ocean. And this is in line with our vision and objective of the Saga Doctrine. Another recent example that comes to mind is the tropical cyclone that hit Mozambique and Tanzania recently. These East African countries here, they are very vulnerable for the impact of tropical cyclones. So when Mozambique or even Tanzania, when they are hit by these disasters, India immediately rushes disaster management assistance. That is HADR assistance, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to these countries. Even back in 2004, when Sri Lanka, Maldives were hit by the Indian Ocean tsunami, and even though India itself was affected, India supplied disaster management assistance to all these countries. So since many years, we have retained our dominant position here. We have been helping countries. We are just stepping on it, giving more focus and attention under the Saga Doctrine. One important point I would like to highlight here is that when Prime Minister Modi visited this region in 2015, it was a historic visit. Because he visited Seychelles and Mauritius, 
and he inaugurated a key strategic project of India that is the Coastal Surveillance Radar Project. Along with that, important agreements were signed between India, Mauritius and India and Seychelles. Through these agreements, Mauritius and Seychelles, they agreed to lease a strategic island to India and India is looking to build connectivity infrastructure on these strategic islands. The names of these islands and their location can be very important for your prelims. Mauritius has leased the Agalega Islands that you can see over here, located right next to Diego Garcia, where the US has a major military base. Then Seychelles has leased the Assumption Island over here, located closer to East Africa, located near the, the piracy infested waters. So India has gained access to the Assumption Island of Seychelles and the Agalega Islands of Mauritius. And India is building connectivity infrastructure on these islands. It's been reported that India is building docking facilities, essentially port facilities and airstrips. So India, Seychelles and Mauritius maintain that these are economic projects to boost economic growth. But these projects can always be given a military application. It will always enhance the reach of the Indian Armed Forces, particularly the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force. So that gives India enhanced reach, military reach across the Indian Ocean and helps counter the external powers which are building their military presence over here. It will help India to stand on the same lines of US or China to ensure that India remains a dominant military power along with being an influential economic power. So that is why the Sagar Doctrine is so very significant and India has been taking many big initiatives of late. Recently, just a few months back, India has established a security platform for the Indian Ocean called the Colombo Security Conclave or the Colombo Security Conference. See, back in 2011, India, Sri Lanka and Maldives, they had entered into a trilateral maritime security arrangement. Through this trilateral maritime security arrangement, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives were collaborating in the field of maritime security. India was helping Sri Lanka and Maldives in securing their maritime integrity. So now India has expanded this trilateral initiative and even included Mauritius under it and it has been transformed into the Colombo security conclave. This allows the national security advisors of these four countries to meet regularly, interact with each other and to tackle the security challenges of the region. Along with these four nations, Bangladesh and Seychelles, the other major Indian Ocean countries, they have been admitted as observers to the Colombo security conclave. There are proposals to include them as full-time members as well in the future. So through such platforms, India has taken the leadership role to guarantee the maritime security of the Indian Ocean. Along with this, we recently became a member. Please make a correction here, not a member, but we recently became an observer of an important regional group of the Indian Ocean. That is the Indian Ocean Commission or IOC. The Indian Ocean Commission is an important regional group of the western part of the Indian Ocean region and in 2021, India was admitted as an observer to the group. This grouping plays an important role in the western part of the Indian Ocean and it has key member countries such as Seychelles, Comoros, Mauritius, French Reunion and Madagascar. These are the member countries, the five member countries of the Indian Ocean Commission. It's an important regional grouping focused on the western part of the Indian Ocean that is closer to Eastern Africa. In East Africa, China has already been spreading its influence. So India is also countering this by trying to engage with all the countries here along with engaging with these important regional groupings. So in 2021, India was also admitted as an observer to the Indian Ocean Commission so that we can get... We, we get to work more closely with Mauritius, Comoros, Seychelles, Madagascar and French Reunion, which is an overseas territory of France. As you know, India-France already have a close defense relationship. So India-France can collaborate, work together and enhance their military presence and strategic presence in the western part of the Indian Ocean. Apart from this, India has extended its focus all across the Indian Ocean. We are not just limited to Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius and East Africa. 
India is looking at all the littorals of the Indian Ocean and recently we have gained port access to few strategic ports such as the Sabang port here in Indonesia that overlooks the Strait of Malacca. India has also gained port access to the Dukum port in Oman located near the Strait of Hormuz. We've already invested in the Chabahar port of Iran which again lies near the Strait of Hormuz. So by gaining such port access, by increasing its military and economic presence all across the Indian Ocean, India is emerging as a predominant power of the Indian Ocean. This is the essential crux of the Saga Doctrine and under this vision, we have given utmost focus to maritime security and to build our maritime domain awareness. Meaning we want to strengthen our maritime awareness all across the Indian Ocean. For this purpose, India has executed an important project called the Coastal Surveillance Radar Project. This project was launched after the 2611 Mumbai attacks of 2008, which exposed India's weakness in coastal security and maritime security. Under this Coastal Surveillance Radar Project, a chain of radars have been set up all across India's coastline. Entire coastline of India, along with the islands, that is Andaman, Nicobar and Lakshadweep, they have been covered with these radars that has been built by BEL, Bharat Electronics Limited. That was phase one of this project. Phase one was just focused on India. In phase two, we have expanded this initiative and offered these coastal surveillance radars free of cost to many friendly countries, including Mauritius, Seychelles and Sri Lanka. At Mauritius and Seychelles, the surveillance radars have already been set up and these were the radars that were inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi in 2015 when he visited these two countries and he announced the launch of the Sagar Doctrine of India. We are planning to expand the coverage further by setting up coastal surveillance radars in Maldives as well along with bringing Bangladesh and Myanmar also on board this security initiative. These chain of radars that India is setting up all across the Indian Ocean, it will provide real-time coverage of the entire shipping traffic of the Indian Ocean. It will help the Indian Navy, which is monitoring the headquarters of this project, to have a complete real-time picture of the entire shipping traffic of the Indian Ocean. So all the radar data is fed, fed into the regional command centers of the Indian Navy and it is further integrated into a national headquarters located at Gurugram, which is known as the Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean Region or IFC IOR. This is the headquarters of the Coastal Surveillance Radar Project and it serves as a national intelligence command network. It's operated by the Indian Navy. It gives the Navy complete picture about the Indian Ocean and the movement of ships all across the Indian Ocean. Because these radars are set up not just along India's coastline and India's island territories, but they've also been extended to other friendly countries like Mauritius, Seychelles and Sri Lanka. We are looking to expand this further into Maldives, Bangladesh and Myanmar as well. It's through initiatives like these that India is strengthening its maritime security and offering security to other countries under the Saga Doctrine. We are also focusing on a new model of economic growth and economic development called the Blue Economy Model or also called the Ocean Economy Model. Today, this is the model of growth and development being promoted even by the United Nations in coastal countries, in coastal states. It is in line with the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN and it provides for sustainable exploitation of marine resources. That is the focus of the Blue Economy Model. Many countries are adopting it. It is backed by the UN and many other global institutions. It is in line with our Sustainable Development Goals. It basically provides for sustainable exploitation of our marine and coastal resources and to ensure that the coastal communities are protected. That is the focus of the blue economy model. To sustainably exploit the marine resources and ensure that the benefits of this exploitation is channeled towards the socio-economic development of the coastal communities. So India is pioneering the blue economy model all across the Indian Ocean and we are promoting this with our friendly countries through our bilateral ties we are also promoting it through major groupings of the Indian Ocean like IORA. IORA 
or the Indian Ocean Rim Association. It's an important regional grouping of the Indian Ocean that was founded by India. India was one of the founding members. There are more than 20 countries that are part of this grouping called IORA. So at the Indian Ocean Rim Association, India is working with Australia, South Africa and many other countries. And here as well we are promoting the blue economy model, which is a sustainable model of economy development. So coming to the end of our discussion, I would like to highlight that the essence of the Sagar doctrine of India, the core vision of Sagar doctrine is to help India retain its predominant position in the Indian Ocean. That is what India is trying to do through all these security and economic initiatives. For this purpose, we have launched a soft power initiative, a cultural initiative called Project Mossum. It's executed by the Ministry of Culture and we are trying to revive our ancient trade and cultural links that we had with regions across the Indian Ocean. All the regions that relied on the trade winds, the monsoon trade winds, which had historical economic and strategic relations and cultural relations with India. With those regions, India is trying to rebuild those ties under Project Mossum, which is a soft power cultural initiative. So even this happens to be a part of the Sagar vision or the Sagar doctrine. So the essence, the idea is to help India become the dominant power of the Indian Ocean, counter all the external powers like China, maybe even the US, and ensure that India guarantees the security of all the countries over here. That is both maritime security and economic security. So on this note, I would like to conclude my short discussion on the Sagar Doctrine. So let's take all the questions that are there. First question, Sagar Doctrine counters the Chinese sea aggression policy. Yes, absolutely yes. The Sagar Doctrine of India is primarily designed to counter Chinese aggression and Chinese influence in the Indian Ocean. Next question, China has no presence in the eastern part of Indian Ocean. China does have a big presence all across the Indian Ocean, from Thailand to Indonesia to Singapore, right? So across the eastern part of Indian Ocean, China does have an act active presence. It has very strong economic strategic ties with those countries. China is very influential all across Southeast Asia. So just like it is influential in Africa, in West Asia, China is very influential and dominant in Southeast Asia as well. Next, how come France is part of IORA? It is far away from Indian Ocean. That's a good question. See, France is part of IORA because France has an overseas territory that I showed you. French Reunion or La Reunion is a French territory in the Indian Ocean. Just like Britain has an overseas territory in the Indian Ocean. So obviously, France is a major maritime naval power of the Indian Ocean. France also counters piracy and terrorism in the Indian Ocean. Right? So since France has a, a territory here in the Indian Ocean, it is also part of the IORA grouping. Last question, do you think Indian Ocean will lead to full-scale war in the future? Given that China is a major power, cannot afford to allow India and US to dominate it. See, definitely tensions have been ri rising all across the Indo-Pacific between US and China and also between India and China in the Indian Ocean. As of now, there are no chances of any larger conflict breaking out, but the tensions are definitely there. The rivalry, the geopolitical tensions are definitely visible. But if any big mistakes are made in the future, if any big dispute breaks out, right, and if there is a miscalculation on either of the sides, then there is a potential for a bigger conflict. But as of now, we don't see that happening. But definitely a Cold War-like rivalry is likely to continue between India, China, and also between US and China. Okay. So guys, these were the questions that were there. I've tried answering all of them. So I hope it was a productive, fruitful session. I hope you've learned about India's Saga Doctrine and why the Indian Ocean is important for India. So if you like the session, do let me know by liking the video. Don't forget to comment below and as well as subscribe to our channel. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.